Okay. So let's begin with the abbreviation. Relax your body, relax your mind. Maybe Dorji can turn off the fan that's because it's so cold in here. You probably don't need there we go. Thanks. There are two kind of obstacles to your concentration, the outer ones, outer sounds and feelings and distractions, and the inner ones, the thoughts. So see if you can, by withdrawing your attention inward, focusing on the breathing, let go of the outer ones, your attention to outer stimuli, and recalling the value of concentration let go of your attention to inner ones. All of the problems and worries and desires and so forth that we might have in our mind from the point of view of ultimate wisdom are empty. And particularly withdraw your attention to your heart. If you'd like to follow one breath up your nostrils to the crown of your head, to your throat, to your heart. And leave your attention there, your heart chakra, your mind. Withdrawing your attention away from the outer senses. Be aware 
of that which you've begun to see in previous meditation sessions, the nature of that mind behind the varied appearances. The mind has no shape or color, so if you're focusing on something that has a shape or color, recognize that's just an appearance within the clarity of the mind. Let go of that. Try to recognize this clear light nature as our conventional Buddha potential. And the wisdom that's understanding that is perhaps more suitable to be imputed as I than the sense of I that we usually grasp to. See if you can actually instigate a sense of the ego, the sense of I in your mind. Thinking of something in which you, some situation in which you have been accused or in which the ego rises strongly, perhaps anger or attachment. where there's an undeniable sense of self, I. Just watch that from, let your mind act in its ordinary way with that. One part of your mind is through just a corner of your awareness Watch how the eye seems to be appearing. And how the mind seems to be reacting to that. Is it rejecting that appearance of the eye or is it actually accepting it, grasping to it? That I, which has arisen due to some dynamic situation, the anger or attachment, some afflicted state, if that I doesn't actually exist the way that our mind is grasping to it, and on the basis of which we engage in other activities, If it doesn't exist like that, much of our action, all of our actions mainly, are based on this ignorance 
which only creates, out of total unreality, creates future suffering for us. And all living beings, even those that, like us, have a fortunate rebirth of leisure and endowment, all those that still have a mind with some imperfection, either trapped in samsara or not yet attained enlightenment, all of them have been our mother in numberless times. Like the mother of this life, guided us, cared for us, educated us, protected us, gave us enjoyments, numberless times, depthlessly kind. We don't recognize them as such. They all want to be happy, want to be free of suffering, just the same as we do. With some recollection, some remembering consciousness of our study of renunciation, that there is no real pleasure to be found in cyclic existence, and a sense of compassion for all these beings. I think I'm going to participate tonight and continue to practice in this life and other lives to eradicate this self-grasping from my mind, self-cherishing attitude, and to do so I'm going to study more about the mind, to get more clear in my understanding of it, the laboratory of all my experience, and so that I can be more prepared to study and learn about emptiness and other subjects as, as my wisdom increases. I'm going to listen to the teachings to become enlightened, quickly become enlightened for the sake of all living beings. Bring your attention back. Relax. Oh, some people were waiting to come in. That's nice. Dan, there he is. <clears throat> How's everyone? The weather is interesting, huh? Oh. Is it, how is it outside? Is it hot outside? It's also cold outside. Mm -hmm. The other day someone came and said it was outside. It was outside of this little enclave of redwoods. It was sunny. Maybe that was the other day. Mm -hmm. Okay. So anyone have any uh, pressing questions? Don. That's a pressing question. Where's it pressing? <laughs> what? No, I'm joking. I'm just teasing. Just teasing. Am I better off not heard that? Yes. Better, better <laughs> you did. You heard that, but it was inattentive, I think. That's true. Uh, in the definition of conceptual consciousness, uh, could you uh, go over with the, the meaning of sound generally and in general? What if I said no? <laughs> no, go ahead. <laughs> no, 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 come on. That's, that's a new one. I haven't heard that before. Um, yeah, I mean that's part of that's what we're gonna we're gonna get, continue on that today, certainly. But um, in in your general sort of survey of, of what we've been going through. Any uh, kind of doubts, lingering doubts or questions? Okay. So
So we've gotten up to chapter four, right? Or did we skip something? No, I think we've got essentially up to chapter four, right? The on page forty-two in the printing that we have, other divisions of consciousness. <clears throat> so what what divisions of consciousness have we been talking about up till now? This is other divisions of consciousness, as though there's something that we've already been encountering. Well, how they're broken down into seven different types. Of seven kinds. So what are those seven kinds of consciousness? Okay. Direct perceiver. Direct perceiver is one of them? Seven types of awarenesses. Mm -hmm. Direct perceiver. Or uh, subsequent cognizer. Inferential cognizer. Do you hear what she said? Doubting consciousness. Oh, doubting consciousness. Yeah. 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 Presumption. So, I have a question for you. The way that um, Thea's uh, enumerated them, she said direct perception and inference. So, if you said that, you'd have to say that uh, there are some of these that are that there are some states of mind that are more than one of these seven ways of knowing, right? <clears throat> if you just say direct perception and inference, <clears throat> excuse me, which other of the seven states of mind might be one of those two? Subsequent. Subsequent. Cognition could be a uh, could be a direct perceiver. What else? Could be it could be an inferential could it be an inferential cognizer? Could there be a subsequent cognition that which is a subsequent cognizer? Mm -hmm. Let me think. Dan? Yeah. What according to these tenets, <clears throat> if something's an inferential cognizer, it's only it has to depend directly upon a sign which is its its uh, cause, and so a subsequent cognizer can arise from an inferential cognizer, but inferential cognizer has to be just the first instant for this, for these uh, tenants right here, right? So that wouldn't be uh, an example, but you could have a direct perceiver, which is a subsequent cognition, because that's one of the divisions often in direct perceiver. What other of those seven ways of knowing would overlap one of those first two? Inattentive uh, consciousness to which uh, an object appears but is not apprehended, or not ascertained rather, that would be what? That could be an inferential cognitor that's inattentive? No, it would be one of the divisions of a direct perceiver. It could be a direct perceiver. So, how about the other ones <clears throat> of the seven, the way that, that Thea listed them? So, I'll say, let's go let, to the way you said direct perceiver, inference, subsequent cognition. What order should we put them? Um, wrong consciousness, doubt, correct belief, and inattentive perception. <clears throat> Leave off the first two. So just talk about the other five. Okay. Wrong consciousness. What do we have? Doubt. Uh, correct belief. Oh, so, I left off. Subsequent cognition and inattentive perception. So that's five, five others after we leave the first off, right? Because there's seven altogether. Any of those can overlap? Can there be anything that's, any mind which is more than one of those? Not counting direct perception and inference. Do you follow, Rita, do you follow what I'm saying? Like say, for instance, take, the, take, take subsequent cognition Can subsequent cognition can can that can something be both a subsequent cognition and a wrong consciousness? No. 
Can something, be, you said sure? No. Can something be a subsequent cognition and a doubt? Why not? Because a subsequent cognizer is A subsequent cognizer realizes its object, and doubt doesn't realize its object. It's of two points about something. It just is not even as strong as a correct belief. How about subsequent cognizer and correct belief? Can there be something which is both? No, it's not incontrovertible either, because a correct belief, <clears throat> although it might have reached, it, it can be factually correct, can be factually concordant, it's, it hasn't realized its object. So it can't be a subsequent cognizer. And uh, can something be a subsequent cognizer and a inattentive perception? Can you have the subsequent instant of a, no, because that doesn't realize its object either, right? Okay, so take, take the second ones uh, after subsequent cognition, wrong consciousness. Can any of the others that are left over be a wrong consciousness? Can a doubt be a wrong consciousness? Yes. One part of doubt can be, wrong can be a wrong consciousness, right? Uh, what's after that? Correct belief. Can that be a wrong consciousness? Because why not? And, and as opposed to wrong. Okay, something to investigate what the meaning is correct, but let, let's assume, leave that for the time being. Uh, how about, uh, what, what's the other one? What's that? Inattentive? inattentive? Can a wrong consciousness be inattentive? Yes. Because uh, <clears throat> a direct perceiver can be in, inattentive, right? Mm -hmm. Can a direct perceiver a direct, in fact, if, if some, <coughs> excuse me, if something is a direct perceiver, and something is inattentive, it necessarily is a direct perceiver, isn't it? Because you, you, you don't have any kind of conceptual inattentive perceptions, although it seems like it should be, like some kind of conceptual mind, mental conceptual mind, which is, paying attention to one thought and then another thought is there and it's not paying attention to that. That's not called an inattentive perception. It only, it's, it's only a division of direct perception. <clears throat> and um, so you have to check whether wrong consciousness could be in, inattentive. Can you have a, let's say, a, it would have to be a direct perceiver which is wrong. You can have some direct perceivers that are wrong, right? Or can you? Can you have a direct perceiver that's wrong? No. Why not? It's direct perceiver? No. Direct perceivers are not necessarily... Uh, do they real? Do direct perceivers necessarily realize their objects? No, because inattentive perception is a division of direct perceiver. What was the? What's the definition of a direct perceiver? Is it does a direct perceiver? Does it have to realize its object? Isn't it just, it's non conceptual and non mistaken. Is that is that, is that all it is? An awareness which is non conceptual and non mistaken? What was the definition of a direct perceiver? Find it first. Knowers which are free from conceptuality and non mistake. Which page? Page 6. Oh. 14, right? Bottom of 14. And the definition of an awareness which is a direct perceiver is a knower which is free from conceptuality <clears throat> and non mistaken. It'd be enough to say non mistaken, we said at the time. So that means not mistaken with respect to its appearing object. But if it's not appear if it's not mistaken with its appearing object, you have to check whether it actually realizes. Does it realize its object? Not necessarily, because an inattentive perception is also a direct perceiver, right? So not all direct perceivers realize their object. Couldn't you have a sense direct perceiver that is a wrong? Perception. Could you have a sense direct perceiver which is a wrong perceiver? Yeah. 
not just not realize its object, but realize it wrongly? No, if it's, if it's a direct perceiver, it's got, it's got to be unmistaken with respect to its appearing object, which for... Um, so when we talked about, say, the non say non-conceptual mistaken consciousness. We didn't we didn't say we didn't say mistaken direct perception because by definition a um, direct perceiver is mis is unmistaken. Okay, so it in the case of being mistaken with respect to your appearing object, then it's no longer a direct perceiver. It's called a non-conceptual mistaken consciousness. So here the reason I bring this up is if you look at these seven Usually, the first two are not called, of the seven ways of knowing, they're not just called direct perceivers and inferential cognizers. They're called prime direct perceivers and prime inferential cognizers. And that way, the only overlap that I, that I see offhand, there might be some other doubt, is um, that one part of doubt can be a wrong consciousness. Right. Which which kind of doubt is that? Yeah, leaning doubt that's thinking the wrong thing, right? Leaning in the wrong direction. And remember that we had quotations here that said that uh, that can be wrong consciousness. Remember that from Galsip J or someone said that uh, you had to, you had to accept that um, part of doubt could be wrong consciousness, that it could, that it's leaning, the doubt that's leaning in the wrong direction, even though it's, it hasn't single-pointedly made up its mind about, you know, that this is, this is the way it is, that still is a wrong consciousness, even if it's doubting in that, even though it's, it's, it hasn't reached a conclusion, okay? Like a wrong, you might say a wrong belief or something like that. Because, like, for instance, a, a doubt leaning in the right direction is not yet a correct belief, right? It hasn't reached certainty about its object. There's still two-pointedness about it. Okay, so in some of the uh, presentations of the seven ways of knowing, it doesn't say just direct perceiver and inference. Uh, it says uh, direct prime cognizers because then the direct prime cognizer would not. Would, could there be? Could it, there be anything else that's a direct prime cognizer of the seven? If you, if the first one was it's rather than direct perceiver was direct prime cognizer, could any of the seven be that? Could you? Could it be inattentive? No, because inattentive doesn't realize its object. Couldn't be doubt. Couldn't be a. <coughs> it's got to be a realizing consciousness. How many of them are? If you take. The first two as direct prime cognizer. The first two as prime cognizers. Mm -hmm. Direct prime cognizer, inferential prime cognizer. Um, which of the others uh, are realizing consciousnesses? Subsequent. So those three: direct prime cognizer, uh, inferential prime cognizer, subsequent cognition. Where would you put just an ordinary prime cognizer? Is there, is there something missing out of the seven if, if the way that I'm saying the first one should be prime direct perceiver or, or prime direct cognizer? Do you follow it? Am I, you lost? So, so the, the, the way that uh, Thea had set out, she said the first one was direct perceiver, second one was inference. So I'm saying if, you, if it's set out that way, then there are several things that, that there are Direct perceiver can be a subsequent cognition and can be a, a inattentive perception. So you have overlap of these seven ways of knowing. So then I'm, I'm proposing maybe the first two should be prime direct perceiver and prime inferential cognizer. That is, ones that actually that are uh, fresh and so forth, that realize their object. If that were the case, is there some kind of direct perceiver that's not included in there? Because it is not just called direct perceiver, it's just called prime direct perceiver. Do you follow, Chris? I think so. Are you, uh, 
So what would give you, can you give an example? Subsequent cognizer would not be prime, but could be direct, yes? You're right. But, but that would, that's the third division, right? Right. Okay, anything, any other direct perceiver that's not found in there? Because there were three divisions of direct perceivers. There were prime cognizers, subsequent cognitions, and inattentive perceptions. Both of the other two are there as the division. Say, if, if we go in order, prime direct perceiver, prime inference, or in this case, we don't have to say the word prime, we can just say inferential cognizer, subsequent cognition, and then I'll go in, in order of going from wrong consciousness to doubt, to correct belief, and then we throw in inattentive perception at the end. So if you, if you put it that way, if you say this, of the seven ways of knowing, the first way of knowing, or whatever order you put them, one of them is prime <coughs> direct perceiver, then there's no overlap. The only kind of overlap you have is between one part of doubt being possibly wrong consciousness. Okay, otherwise everything else is distinct. Do all consciousnesses fit into one of those categories? All awarenesses? If I were to say prime direct perceiver, inferential cognizer, subsequent cognition, you know, wrong consciousness, doubt, correct belief, inattentive perception, anything that doesn't fit into one of those? So this is usually, when you talk about the seven ways of knowing, I think usually the first two are called realizing. The, the first three are realizing consciousnesses. The first two are prime, if you know if we put it in this order. So that way there's not so much overlap between them. Why? What's the what's the what's the uh, criterion of a wrong consciousness? So a doubt leaning in the wrong direction for you is not a wrong consciousness. It's still got doubt. Right. Okay. So take take a look on page forty. Okay. So a paragraph up from the last paragraph. The last paragraph is talking about the fifth wrong consciousness. So one paragraph up where it says furthermore. Or even the paragraph right above that. The pervasion that whatever is a wrong consciousness is necessarily a conceptual wrong consciousness exists because wrong thought and conceptual wrong consciousness are both synonyms. Okay, that's okay. That's not the one. Furthermore, it follows that wrong consciousness and doubting consciousness are not contradictory. Because according to you, they would be contradictory, right? Wrong consciousness and doubting consciousness. That's, that's and I'm, just, I'm not saying, that's you. That's, If two things are contradictory, that means if it's one thing, it cannot be the other. Right? So, it, what you what you're thinking makes a lot of sense. You know, it's it's a very in fact that's why a couple of sentences and, and this point is brought up because that doubt that qualm that you have is something that does arise in mind. It doesn't sound like a doubt leaning in the wrong direction would be a wrong consciousness because like we have the feeling like a wrong consciousness is like really made up its mind yeah. like the analog of a correct belief beyond doubt right after doubt leaning in the right in the right direction when you reach certainty about that you've got a correct belief so what you'd like to think is a wrong consciousness is the next step beyond doubt leaning yet yeah, where it's reached a conclusion right yeah. okay so here it says according to these tenets it says Although, you, you might argue, you could argue, you'd say, in order to make these seven, you could argue. If you, if you understood, you wouldn't lose any points in a debate or something, or in a, an examination, if you explained your position. You said, according, you know, according to the tradition that we're reading, it says that uh, the seven, of these seven ways of knowing, it seems as though there's a small overlap between doubt and wrong consciousness, doubt leading in the wrong direction. In order to to, in order that they be, uh, you know, 
separate, you could say that uh, I, I'm positing them to be different or something like that, that a, that a, that a, uh, a doubting consciousness leading in the, wrong conscious, in the wrong direction is not a wrong consciousness. But then you'd have to, you'd have to deal with yeah. this quotation where he says, what does it say? They're not contradictory. This is because the doubt which thinks that sound is probably permanent is both a wrong thought and a doubting consciousness. In accordance with that, I said Gelsip Gel J before us, Kedrup J's clearing away darkness of mind with respect to the seven treatises. He says, in that text he says, the assertion that all wrong thoughts possess an aspect which is definite as one pointed mode of apprehension is incorrect. So he's speaking directly to you, directly to us, who think that wrong consciousness has to be one-pointed, like it's made up its mind. He says it's not, and that's not the case, because it would follow that the conceptual consciousness, thinking that sound is probably permanent, would not be a wrong thought. And he continues, therefore, wrong thought and doubt are not contradictory. Okay, so according to our tenets here, there's a small overlap of those Seven. Does that make some sense? Hmm? Okay. So let's go now. So those. That's one way of dividing consciousness in an elaborate way. Most kinds of states of mind. I'm not sure if every, you know. You you have to investigate. Maybe everything, every kind of state of mind would have to be included in those. That's why it's called the seven ways of of knowing. Um. You can divide consciousness other ways, just like you take a pie, like say, divide it up, you know, this way, or you can cut it, you know, in pieces rectilinearly, or you can cut it according to the, you know, from the center. You can cut a pie different ways, right? You can cut up consciousness in different ways too. So another way of dividing, the other ways the further that we got that we talk about just conceptual and non-conceptual, right? But here, first we encounter a threefold. Right here, we're talking about a threefold uh, division of consciousness into, uh, in terms of their objects of apprehension. So, conceptual consciousness, that's the first one. Non conceptual, non mistaken consciousness, and non conceptual, mistaken consciousness. So, it's always appended with what's their apprehended object. Conceptual consciousness, which takes a meaning generality as its apprehended object. Do you remember apprehended object? That's a synonym of what? Do you know what the, um, this terminology, Venerable, from studying? Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So apprehended object is a synonym of what? Appearing object. So if something's taking, its, taking something as its apprehended object, that means it's appearing object. So what's, its, what's the appearing object of a conceptual consciousness? Meaning generality in general. Here, you might say, well, later, later it's talking about there's two different things, meaning generality and sound generality. Generally, both meaning generality and sound generality are meaning generalities. But when you divide it up, there's a slight difference in what kind of meaning generality, sort of mental image they are. Non-conceptual, non-mistaken consciousness, and what kind of appearing object does it have? A, a apprehended object does it have? It has a specifically, it takes a specifically characterized phenomena as its apprehended object. Remember, specifically characteri characterized phenomena as opposed to, Chris, do you remember? Generally, generally characterized phenomena is synonymous with. Uh, with objects of thought, but it's, it's uh, synonymous with permanent phenomena, and uh, that which is unable to perform a function, according to Sotrante. Specifically characterized phenomena is a synonym of impermanent phenomena, impermanent things, and so they are able to perform a function. There's at least, at least three synonyms, you know. So specifically characterized phenomena are impermanent, they're able to perform a function. If anything's impermanent, it's able to perform a function according to these tenets. If something is permanent, it's not able to perform a function according to Satranta. According to actually according to lowest the lowest philosophical school 
as we look at them here, the vibhashaka, in permanent, uh, permanent things can perform a function. Some, some impermanent things can perform a function. So they say <laughs> space can perform the function of allowing things to move in it. Space is permanent, right? non compounded space. So the, the Satrantika say, oh, yeah, come on, yeah, that's, you're, you're missing the point. It's, it, its presence, the fact that things can move in it, doesn't mean that it, it performs the function. So any, according to Satrantika and higher schools, if something is uh, permanent, it, doesn't, it isn't able to perform a function. Yeah. How about... Um, Doji? Mm -hmm. Emptiness, would that form the function of um, helping one understand, uh, develop one's wisdom? Is that so, so according to you, <laughs> <laughs> uh, emptiness. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, Dorothy, let, let's get a look. Let's get a look at you here. Come on. Does it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All this time you wondered who was behind. Actually, in the very first class, you saw Dorji's fine face in the mirror when the camera used to be in the back. He, he, was, he was way before he, he uh, scanned in. You know, you could see him looking there. In the machine, you could see so now you know who Dorji is, all of you who are watching this, this DVD years later, you know, in Mongolia or someplace. <laughs> this is the great Dorji. So according to you, uh, this is how this is how one would this is this is how the, they they sarcastically would start the debate, right? You know, to to cause the ego of the other person to rise. You know, yeah. Well, <laughs> I haven't I haven't haven't get haven't, I haven't thought of a good abs absurd consequence yet. I'm just according to you, I'm just I'm just checking. Uh, so um, emptiness has the function of creating wisdom. So wherever there's emptiness, wisdom should be generated. So, you know, out in the outer expanse of space where there's no, no one paying attention, maybe the Buddha's mind is perceiving it, but not, you know, other people. Uh, wherever emptiness exists, it has the function of creating wisdom? No. Yeah, no. <laughs> Remember, I, 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 used, I told you several times, Lama Yeshi many, many times said, nothing special about emptiness. Even kaka has emptiness. <laughs> emptiness is very common. It's not something special. What's special is the wisdom that realizes emptiness. Right? So there's, when you talk about permanent things, it's, it's, uh, it's worth investigating because it'll come up again when you talk about the Four Noble Truths. You know, the thir what's the third Noble Truth? Zization. <laughs> the truth of cessation. So, is the, the the first truth, the truth of suffering, is that permanent or impermanent? The truth of suffering. <laughs> mm -hmm. well, it's impermanent. Cause of suffering is impermanent. True cessation. Uh, that which is perceived by the Arya beings, uh, is that permanent or impermanent? It's permanent, right? Do you know that? True cessation is permanent. But isn't it created? Does it, like for instance, suffering has its cause, true, true causes of suffering, true origin of suffering. Cessation, doesn't it have its cause, the true path? If it has a cause, if it's causative, or if, it's, if it is the result of something, if it is a result, then it is not permanent. Because uh, when you talk about impermanent, permanent things, anything which is either a cause or a result has to be impermanent. Because it has resulted or, been, or is the cause of something and, and brings something about. So, uh, like Dorji was thinking maybe in a sense that emptiness is a cause of the realization maybe because it's the object of the of the wisdom that's perceiving it or that's being generated but or a person might think that because cessation is the result of true paths therefore it's impermanent 
Is cessation the result of true paths? This is something that uh, when you deal on you investigate the Four Noble Truths, uh, you find is not the case. Although it, so it sounds like it should be, you know, of course, yeah, cessations come about because, right, Maureen? This just seems obvious, right? I thought you were right. <laughs> no, I mean, it, it seems right, right? Yeah, so yeah, yeah, true, you follow the true path, and then the result is you get true cessations. But true cessations are the, um, one of the, in the Abhidharma Kosha, it says there's three kinds of permanent phenomena. There's many other kinds of permanent phenomena, but it says space and the two cessations. And one of the cessations means this true cessations, analytical cessations the only permanent kind of phenomena that they, they note in the Abhidharma Kosha. So we, we know from the beginning that it's, it's said to be permanent. So why is, it, why is it permanent? Because when something, when a delusion has actually been ceased, not just temporarily suppressed like through developing uh, tranquil abiding, remember we talked before, or developing uh, vipassana, you develop the first jhana, it said that you're separated from attachment to the desire realm if, with that particular state of mind. Maybe you've heard that expression, separation from attachment. Or uh, Sometimes it even says in the teachings, there's even a kind of, it says that that attachment is abandoned. But it doesn't mean abandoned in the sense of not returning. It just means temporarily suppressed. When you have an actual abandonment of something, a true uh, actual abandonment, what you've abandoned has been ceased. It is a true cessation. Okay, if you've abandoned something by seeing the antidote of emptiness, realizing emptiness directly, that, let's say that delusion or that affliction is gone from your mind, okay, but it is gone, it is not as though one moment is gone and the next minute it's there. If something, for something to be impermanent, it has to be momentary. That means it's there, it changes from moment to moment. Something which is a cessation, or like emptiness also, doesn't change from moment to moment. You might say, well, what about the emptiness of this microphone? If this microphone, whatever is this, um, little transmitter, FM transmitter, if this, th this has an emptiness, right? Uh, doesn't that emptiness go out of existence? When I break this transmitter, what do you think, Venerable? Therefore, it's impermanent, right? No, it's not, but you have like permanence that are occasional. Permanence that are... As the Italians say, eccola. Eccola. There you go. Remember, we talked before that there, uh, according to Buddhist understanding, that things, even if thing is, something is permanent, it doesn't mean that it's eternal. So, true cessations. The fact that they're permanent doesn't mean they have to be eternal. It just means that, that once they're existing, they're not changing moment by moment. It's not as though anger, once, once anger has been ceased, certain kind of anger or attachment or whatever has been ceased, it's not as though one minute it's there and then it kind of creeps up a little and goes down. Or it's, it's gone. It's permanent. So true paths are not actually the causes of true cessation. So when you, when you take a look in uh, the Lanrim Chemo and other texts, when, and especially in Uttara Tantra, um, great Kirti Sanchal Brahmashri is, is going to be teaching uh, some of Uttara Tantra when he's here. He may, uh, because that's one of the qualities, what, that when we define the, the Buddha jewel, the Dharma jewel, and the Sangha jewel, that's part of the first chapter of Uttara Tantra, where, would, where, do, where do you find true cessations? Is that part of the three jewels? Or is it something different? That's just four, four noble truths and three jewels are different. Would it be the Dharma jewel? What is, what is the actual Dharma jewel? The text, the Kangir, the Tengir, the Tripitaka? Uh, would it be the implementing of the truths? I mean, the living of the truth? The living of the truth. <laughs> Sounds like a good title for a movie. It doesn't sound dynamic. It has to be the living of the lie. It would have to be, <laughs> would be a better title for a movie, right? The living of the truth doesn't sound interesting enough. The living, 
or true lies. There was true lies before. Right? Some of them. Um, yeah, true. If you talk about the Dharma jewel, the Dharma jewel has two aspects: true paths and true cessations. They're both the actual. The actual Dharma jewel are true paths and true cessations. Does the Buddha have either of those in his consciousness? Do true paths uh, have to be antidotes to the delusions? If they do, then the Buddha doesn't have any because he doesn't have any delusions any longer, right? Anyway, think about that. Buddha has true cessations, right? He has true cessation. So the Buddha does have the Dharma jewel. Whether he has, you have to, maybe you have to think whether he has true paths in this country. What do you think, Chris? Does Buddha have true paths? Pardon? Hasn't he transcended that? Transcended that? So let me ask you a question. Is, is the Buddha a Buddhist? <laughs> Venerable, what do you think? Is it Buddhist? What's the definition of a Buddhist? Well, that's, that's just the, someone who seeks refuge out of one of the causes. You have to have the causes. You have to have fear of samsara or fear of, of not being able to help sending things. So, does the Buddha have refuge? Buddha is refuge. But does he have, is he a Buddhist? So it's something you think about. There's debate about these kind of things. Maybe you, in, in the case of Buddha, Buddha's always, the end point is always like an exceptional case. Maybe you can say the Buddha is a resultant refuge. So he's, when we develop ultimate refuge, of course, is the effect state, the resultant state of Buddhahood. So when you, when you attain that state, there's, there's no fear, obviously. So Maureen, I've stirred up some thoughts in your mind. Okay. okay. <laughs> Well, let's look at it the other way. If true cessation is permanent, does it have a cause? What's the cause of emptiness? What's the cause of empty, the emptiness of this cup? Is the, is the cup the cause of the emptiness of the cup? Something, what do you think? I was thinking it's uncaused. Emptiness. It's uncaused. In, Yeah, we say, what, don't we say something uncaused? A non-product, like for instance, something which is a cause, uh, something which is caused, is also another synonym of impermanent pro uh, phenomena, is product, is produced from causes and conditions. So we often hear the term non-produced, non unproduced, uh, you know, when we talk about the qualities of emptiness, make, unproduced, or unborn. Uh, it, Hmm. Is cessation like the uh, analogy of the water with the sediment that's stirred? I mean, uh, the cessation then becomes the clear water that the sediment is cleared from? So the uh, clear water is already always there. Yeah. But you mean the cessation was always there? Uh, uh, uh -huh. uh, I'm not sure because in that case, if, if you're just talking about a settling of the sediment, that would be like a temporary uh, diminishing of the delusions. Like, for instance, developing single point of concentration, developing uh, mundane vipassana, where you separate from attachment, and the delusions become unmanifest, like the mud sinking to the bottom, but you haven't cleared it away so that it will never mm -hmm. rise again. Okay, so something, something to think about. Okay, so let's, let's just begin this section again. Um, we talked about these, we said there were, there's a threefold division of consciousness after the sevenfold. There's probably some other ones too, but this is famous. And so the first one was conceptual consciousness. And the definition was a determinative knower that, which apprehends a sound and a meaning as suitable to be mixed. And the author, the translator has put generality in both, in brackets in both places, a sound generality and a meeting generality <coughs> is suitable to be mixed. And so Don had asked at the beginning, he said, come on, give us a break, explain what this is talking about. 
So there are different ideas. Um, if Bonnie were here, she'd actually read uh, a couple of books on the Sartrantica tenets that um, she was interested. She wanted to go into a little more detail. And so, in general, in general, what it means is uh, you can say it's a determinative knower that would be enough. But here it's talking about, it, to give ki kind of uh, more divisions of it, a determinative knower, because sense consciousnesses, um, direct perceivers and so forth, non-conceptual consciousnesses are not called determinative knowers. Determinative knower is just another synonym for conceptual consciousness. It knows by determining it intellectually. Okay, weighing it, so to speak. So it's a conceptual knower that apprehends a, a, a sound and meaning generalities as suitable to be mixed. So in one way of talking, a sound generality is just whatever appears to your mind when you think a particular word or sound or something is described to you. According to Geshe Repton's explanation, he calls it, in this book, what was, what was he calling those of you who read uh, this uh, reading, you know, minus function. Do you remember what he's calling that here? No, he's calling experiential mental image. I'm sorry. What am I talking? Sound? No, no. So sorry. Uh, nominal mental image. I was thinking of the mental. Nominal mental image. Sound. Sound generality. Me, a nominal mental image. And he says that could be, for instance, the your mental image of Venice by having it explained to you if you've never seen it. Whereas an experiential mental image, the what's called here a meaning generality, uh, according to his explanation, is that which arises from actually seeing something or, or perceiving it. It doesn't have to be seeing, hearing, tasting, actually experiencing it. Okay, then you have a, a uh, experiential mental image. So that's not too far off, except it doesn't, I, from the general point of view, I think, it, uh, a sound generality doesn't have to be developed from just a description. It can be just like you say, someone says to you, um, cappuccino. You don't know what cappuccino is. You just have, you know, that sound generates some mental image in your mind. In fact, for you to say the word again, you have to rely on that that kind of sound generality to even say the word, to express the sound. So it can be from all the way from, uh, sound generality can be anything from just what resonates in your, in your, the mental image that resonates in your consciousness when the sound is said, to the mental image, even if you think you, you've got a mental image of Venice, so clear from being described, that still, uh, according to these explanation that's still a sound generality. It's a mental image that's been developed through mere sound and not through experience. And the, and the what's called the meaning generality is the actual object itself. So those are suitable to be mixed. That is to say, if you've been told uh, there is the, the mug, you don't know what a mug is, and someone says, that's the mug. Or that's Dorje, or whatever, you know. Now that you people now, you know, that's Dorje now. But it's close to experiential. Still, I'm not sure if that's, if you have an experiential mental image of Dorje having seen him on the video, on the DVD. So if someone, so you can have just a sound generality without a meaning generality mixed with it, or you can have a meaning generality without a sound generality, like a, without knowing the name of something. You know, like a cow has a meaning generality of the things around it. It doesn't necessarily give names to it. But you can have a consciousness, conceptual consciousness has the capacity of mixing the two, those two mental images. When you say, you know, when you actually say, this is a cup, and, 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 you, and you, in your mind, the mental image for the word cup is mixed with the mental image of the cup itself. That's kind of the meaning of that. So, should we take a break? Have a mental image of tea and uh, some blood sugar, or not? Master, not the cause of cessation. 
does that state of cessation sort of exist and it's interrupted by our, by our defilement? Or remove the defilements that just becomes clear? So you're saying that cessation is already there, but it's interrupted by, it's interrupted by the delusions. You just said we could attain Buddha's mind by removing the defilements, right? Mm -hmm. Isn't it? Mm -hmm. Isn't that true? It seems true to me, yeah. And maybe I'm asking that in different terms, the cessation being sort of equivalent to Buddha's mind. Uh, cessation is brought about by eliminating uh, some affliction by uh, its antidote such that that affliction will never come back again, its direct antidote, okay, so that it will never come back again. That's actual true cessation. So it's true cessation, would, could you say that in that sense that true cessation exists in our mind now and we don't realize it? Could you say that we are Buddhas now and we don't realize it? Some people do. Some, some, in Kargyu, some other traditions, they take some of the Buddha's teachings uh, from the Uttara Tantra, from the third turning of the Wheel of Dharma, and they say, we, you are already Buddha. All you have to do is realize it. Yes. And in the Gulukpa tradition, I mean, there's some meaning to that. There's profound meaning to that. But it, from a good uh, Gulukpa tradition, that's logically untenable. If we were already Buddha, uh, it would be a mockery of saying we had the omniscient mind and we didn't know it, that we were all knowing. <laughs> you know? So what, what is meant that we have Buddha potential is not that we're already Buddha, but we have the capacity to become Buddha because the, the ultimate nature of the mind is empty of true existence. Because of that fact, the mind is not inherently limited to the deluded state it's in now. It can change. Okay? It's not, if it were inherently existent, if the mind were inherently existent, it couldn't change. So something, maybe you could save some of your questions when uh, Kirti Sancho Brimshay is here and we study Uttara Tantra. So we're talking about uh, this first division here on page... 42 of conceptual consciousness and then it said uh, the term sound sound and meaning refers to a sound generality and the meaning refers to meaning generality that which apprehends those two as mixed apprehends a collection of those two so it's suitable to be as you know it doesn't have to mix the two it can have just a meaning generality in, this, in, in the term in the, of the two, or it could have just a uh, sound generality. Like if I, say a, if I say a sound to you that you don't necessarily have not uh, a, a, an idea of what that sound means, like when, was, when Kerry re, re referred to grokking something, okay? So there was, a, there was a sound generality that was developed in your mind, but that was not, uh, until you actually apprehended uh, maybe in your own, you know, if you're talking about some internal state, when, when we're talking about the mind and mental factors, in order to know what those words mean, you have to actually apprehend the actual state, don't you, within your own consciousness. Talk about what feeling or discrimination or wisdom is. Then you can, you can have a conceptual consciousness which is actually uh, mixing the meaning generality and sound generality. There's a purpose for saying suitable to be mixed because it is necessary to include conceptual consciousnesses in the continuum of a person who is not trained in nomenclature. That means language, you know, like a baby, you know. And when, when they first, see, when the baby first begins to talk, when your kids begin to talk, I said, what was the first thing they said? Dada, mama, something, yeah, something like that. I don't know. Wolf. <laughs> they have a dog called Wolf. And he said, wolf. He pointed, she pointed to the dog or something. So that would be a case when they were trained in enough nomenclature, enough language that they could, they had a mental image of wolf the dog, or the wolf, his actual wolf, and the name, then that could be mixed. Otherwise, it just, it didn't have a name. They saw a wolf, or the child saw a wolf, but had a, had a 
just a meaning generality. When conceptual consciousnesses are divided, there are three. Conceptual consciousnesses that apprehend only a sound generality, those that apprehend only a meaning generality, and those that apprehend both. And that's so. Yeah. The illustration of the first is a consciousness that apprehends only a sound generality, a conceptual consciousness in the continuum of a person who does not know that a bulbous, flat-based thing that is able to perform a function of holding water is a pot, which generated in dependence upon merely the sound pot, apprehends pot. Whew. This is just a sound generality. So just so the mental image that's generated in dependence on merely the sound pot and the person as apprehending, you know, they have some apprehension of pot just by the sound pot or the description of pot maybe. But they haven't seen, you know, like the definition of a pot he, this, that's the rest of this thing here. A bulbous, flat-based thing that is able to perform the function of holding water. There's usually another part of the definition, that which has uh, a, a, a fat belly, a flat base, and a hanging lip, like a lot of the vases have a lip that they hold, you know, they hold the vase up, and is able to hold water. So sometimes, the, the, the Tibetans in the debating court, courtyard, they sometimes that's the definite. They sometimes joke. They say that's the definition of a geshe. <laughs> <laughs> that which has a fat belly, a flat base, a, a hanging lip, and is able to hold water. <laughs> that's a joke. Okay, I wouldn't want you to think. Okay, so that's kind of that's famous definition of a vase, or what does he call it here? Pot, or what does he call it? Pot. Okay, or you could call it vase. Bumba, the famous word bumba. You've heard of bumba? So if you get, you say, if someone asks you the definition of what a bumba is, you would have to give that, that, that which is, has a bulbous belly, or be, what's it, a bul, bul, sweat. bulbous, it is bulbous, flat-based, and uh, has a hanging lip and is able to perform the function of holding water. Um, So if that person doesn't, ha doesn't know such a thing, it, this is a conceptual consciousness in the continuum of a person who does not know such a thing, does not know that a bulbous flat-based thing that is able to perform the function of water is a pot. They don't know that such a thing is called a pot. They may have seen such a thing, they may have seen pots, but you just say pot. Like for instance, if I use Tibetan, I say key. Where's the key? And you say, well, the keys are in my pocket. No, 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 the key. Or like the compass say, chi. What, what is key in Tibetan? Dog. So you've, you've seen dogs, but on, when I say key, or, you know, the Tibetan Lama is saying, key, key, you, know, you might, you would have a, um, this first kind of illustration of a conceptual consciousness that apprehends just a sound generality. Although, Although you do know what a dog is, you're not associating it with that mental image. They're not mixed. They're suitable to be mixed, but they're not mixed at that point. Illustration of the second, only a meaning generality, is um, conceptual consciousness in the continuum of such a person who does not know that a bulbous, flat-based thing able to perform a function of holding water is a pot, which generated independence upon merely seeing a bulbous thing apprehends a bulbous thing. They see the pot, they don't know it's called a pot. And they might call it something else. They might call it a bulbous thing or there's something else, but they're not, they're, they're not mixing it with the uh, name pot. Or there, or there could be someone that's not trained in nomenclature, not, not trained in language. Okay? An illustration of the third, where they're mixed, is a conceptual consciousness that apprehends both a sound and meaning generality is a conceptual consciousness in the continuum of a person who knows pot, knows the word pot, apprehending a pot. So thinking pot, there's not pot here, but thinking, thinking pot, the word pot, and seeing the pot, or, or apprehending pot. And so, and that doesn't mean you're seeing it. You're, you're thinking of a pot by, by thinking that's a pot. What are the sound and meaning generalities of pot? 
That appearance, which is the appearance of a pot to the first conceptual consciousness in the above three illustrations, is just a sound generality. So when someone says pot, and you don't know, or says key, and you don't know what key is, that's just a sound generality. The appearance, which is the appearance of a bulbous thing to the second conceptual consciousness above, is just a meaning generality. Or like the famous example of a cow thinking of its salt block. What is it called? What they lick? Salt lick? Salt lick. Just called salt lick. I told that joke before. <laughs> Salt Lake City. Yeah. Okay. And um, so that would be an example, or a child seeing their mom or dad without knowing any language yet and just smiles and knows them uh, because of that conceptual memory of them. That would be, they, they would have, while they're seeing them, they're knowing them via just that meaning generality conceptually, right? Because both things can be, they're, they're watching and they're having a mental, a conceptual consciousness at the same time. When either a pot or a bulbous thing appears to the third conceptual consciousness, there is the appearance of both a sound and a meaning generality. Okay. So then when conceptual consciousnesses are divided in another way, which way were they just divided? Into those that, that were able to, that apprehended just a sound generality, just a meaning generality, or both. When conceptual consciousnesses are divided in another way, or by means of expression, there are two, conceptual consciousnesses that affix names, and conceptual consciousnesses that affix meanings. Okay. So conceptual consciousness that apprehends <clears throat> its object within thinking this bulbous thing is a pot. Is both a conceptual consciousness that affixes a name and one that affixes a meaning. Respectively, it is respectively it is the first because of being a determinative knower that apprehends its object within affixing the name pot to the object, the bulbous thing. That is, it is a conceptual consciousness that affixes a name. It is also a determinative knower that apprehends its object within affixing or associating attributes to a substratum. This bulbous thing is a pot. Whatever is a conceptual consciousness that affixes a meaning is not necessarily that, that, is, that, that affixes or associates attributes to a substratum, is not necessarily one that affixes a name. For a conceptual consciousness that apprehends its object within thinking, this person has a stick. This may throw you for a loop. Is a conceptual consciousness that affixes only a meaning. What do you think? It's not saying, this is a person, this is John. It's, it is thinking. It might be using some terminology, but it's saying, this person has a stick. <clears throat> it is a conceptual consciousness that apprehends its object within affixing an attribute, stick, to the substratum person. So did some of you read uh, the... Uh, section here. It's a little bit, a little bit interesting because uh, Lati Rupesha gives a different explanation here. Mm. So a thought consciousness affixing a meaning is one which apprehends its object within associating the meaning of a substratum and the meaning of attributes. Is on page 131, about uh, two-thirds of the way down the page. An illustration is a conceptual consciousness that thinks, this person is one who has a stick. 
The stick is the basis, the substratum, and the person is the attribute. It's the opposite of what's said here, right? Here it says what? The attribute is the stick and the substratum is the person. The stick is the substratum, the basis, and the person is the attribute. For if you ask, whose stick is this? The answer would be, that person's. So actually, this, maybe this can, goes to show that attribute and substratum are sort of just labeled, right? There's not something which is, if you talk about a person with a stick, from one point of view, if you talk about from the point of view of the stick, the stick is the basis and the person is its attribute. From the point of view of the person, the person is the, you know, if you're looking, you're mainly considering the person, the person is the basis and the stick is an attribute. You know, this, this person is the one that has the stick, you know, as opposed to some other person. Whereas if you're talking about the stick, there's the, the stick that has the person. So I'm going to go over that a little bit when we talk about, um, in another occasion, when we get to the, maybe the next lesson. So I just want to finish today a little bit about the mental factors. So we're just going to go a little bit faster through here. So you think about that. Also read about the affixing meanings and names. Usually we talk about you know conceptual consciousness that affixes a name is when you actually think uh, you give a name to something. Otherwise, when you're just having a general conceptual consciousness, you're attributing, you're connecting attributes. You don't necessarily, you're not necessarily naming something, you know, that person's beautiful. So you're actually giving, if, if you're using those words, you're, you're giving a name, right? You're attributing names, beauty, to that person, but you're also affixing, you're uh, associating a basis, a person, with attributes, let's say beauty, or ugly, ugliness, or talkativeness, or neediness, or whatever, right? Some kind of attributes. Do you follow? Tentatively. Yes, yes, good. Okay. On page 44, whatever is a conceptual consciousness is not necessarily either of those two. For a conceptual consciousness that apprehends Merely the substratum pot is neither of those two. It's not a, a conceptual consciousness that affixes a meaning, nor a conceptual consciousness that is affixing attributes. Like if you thought, you know, the pot is golden. Wow, that pot is full. That pot is broken. Then you would be, you'd be affixing names and meanings. Right? But here, you, if you just you just you just apprehend pot, you're just thinking of pot. Merely, ap what does it say? Apprehends merely the substratum pot. It, it's not affixing either of them. So something to think about. When conceptual consciousnesses are divided in another way, there are two: factually concordant and not factually concordant or discordant conceptual consciousnesses. So this is simple, right? Definition of a factually concordant conceptual consciousness is a factually concordant determinative knower which apprehends a sound and meaning generality as suitable to be mixed. So um, is a doubting consciousness factually concordant conceptual consciousness? Mark? Dar down? Huh? Oh, <laughs> very sneaky, very sneaky. Very sneaky. Inside yeah. I've been trained in affixing, I've been trained now in affixing the name to the substratum. <laughs> You don't know why. It's only, it's only, only taken 11 it's weeks, only, right? It's only a nominal thing. It's only a nominal thing. It's only taken 11 weeks. It's not that I have great wisdom. It's taken some time. Um, is a doubting consciousness an example of a factually concordant conceptual consciousness? If it's a doubting consciousness leading 
towards the correct view. Toward that which is factual, which is correct. So that's factually concordant? I think it's probably this. Remember when we talked about, it said wrong consciousness didn't have to be one-pointed. Does a factually concordant consciousness have to be one-pointed? doesn't say here. What do you think? Do you think that would be... So then, then the doubt leaning in the right direction wouldn't be factually concordant. True. Because it's still too Even though it's leading, it's probably, sound is probably impermanent. Phenomena are, you know, probably empty of ex true existence. So it doesn't, it, 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 as of yet, it doesn't uh, establish, maybe if you check in uh, Adi Rinpoche's book, whether something is factually concordant, whether that, you know, it doesn't give a fine detail here. If something is an established base, the conceptual consciousness apprehending it is necessarily a factually concordant conceptual consciousness. So if you have a conceptual consciousness apprehending something, it's necessarily a factually concordant conceptual consciousness. So what about doubt? A conceptual consciousness apprehending, if something is an established base, let's say impermanence. What does that mean, established base? Established base. Wouldn't this be correct belief? Well, it could be the other. It could be correct, could be direct perception or subsequent cognition, inference. All of those could be. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. Conceptual consciousness. No, it can't be direct perception. Uh, it could be remembering consciousness, it can be a lot of different, not, not just correct belief, it could be inference is also factually concordant, isn't it? Uh, it means according to the fact, it means kind of true, you know, in accordance with reality. It's not just like imagining the horns of a rabbit. A thought that, that is thinking of the horns of a rabbit is a factually discordant or doesn't accord with reality. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So what about, what about a doubting consciousness, uh, thinking sound? Well, what about just in permanence? Uh, a consciousness thinking sound is impermanent, which is a correct belief. Would that be factually concordant? Probably we'd all agree that'd be factually concordant, right? Mm -hmm. How about the thought that thinks it's probably impermanent? What do you think, Venerable? Does that sound factually and concordant to you? No, maybe factually concordant has to be this dependent on a certain sign or analysis. Or well, then if it, had to, if it had to depend on a sign or analysis, it would have to, then a correct belief couldn't be factually concordant. Mm -hmm. but, a, but a correct belief, remember what the definition of correct belief? Correct belief that depends. There's a lot of different kinds of correct belief. So the definition of a correctly assuming consciousness was a factually concordant determinative knower, which is controvertible with respect to determining its object. So it was factually concordant. What about in the section on doubt? What does it say about... This is how you would determine. You go back and check. Where's, where's the section? Is it doubt after that or before that? Before? Before? When conceptual cognizers are the non prime cognizers. And I think it's after that. Subsequent cognizer, page 39. So, 39. Doubting consciousness is a knower that has qualms too pointedly. And does it give a definition of that which leans in the wrong direction? It doesn't, does it? It just gives the divisions. Tending toward the factual, doubt tending toward the non-factual, because we're talking factually concordant, tending toward or leaning toward the, the factual, an equal doubt. So, something to think about, whether 
uh, doubt leaning in the right direction is factually concordant because would you say a doubt leaning in the wrong direction is factually discordant? Is a, is a, is a conception leaning in the wrong direction, is it a wrong consciousness or not? It's a wrong consciousness, right? Because we just, we, we just went over that at the beginning of class, it's wrong consciousness. So if it's a wrong consciousness, it's got to be, it, one would think it is factually discordant. So maybe something leaning in the right direction is also factually concordant, but something I, my mind is not single-pointedly, I have doubt. Yeah. I have doubt about that, okay. Concord, you know what concordant means? To, to accord with the fact, to be compatible with, in harmony with reality. So certainly things that are single-pointed like wrong consciousness, you know, like when you just talk about wrong consciousness, the general category, or correct belief, or inference, things like that are pretty clear. They're either in accord with reality or they're not. But in terms of doubting consciousness, not so clear to me. What do you think? Okay, I have to check whether there is factually concordant. So you could, that'd be a good debate you can have with someone. You, you can debate about whether you think it's factually concordant. Try to use different reasons and go in other parts of the, the section here. Discordant conceptual consciousness, factually discordant, is a factually discordant determinative knower, which apprehends the sound of meaning generality is suitable to be mixed. If something is not an established base, or you asked what an established base was, an established base is just a synonym of existent phenomena. So remember earlier we were talking about permanent and impermanent, and Chris was saying a a specifically characterized phenomena was synonymous with impermanent, which is synonymous with what? Able to perform a function, product, uh, what else? Cause, effect, all of those are synonyms of, if, this, if it's one of those things, it has to be impermanent, right? Permanent phenomena had to, were, a synonym of that was generally characterized phenomena, not able to perform a function, non-product, non-effect, non-cause, different things like that. There are other kinds of things. Then there's a general, there are many synonyms for existent, that which is existent. So phenomena, the Tibetan, the, the word dharma. Do you know the word dharma? It can mean like we think of the holy dharma or something, but phenomena in general is uh, the same word, dharma. Right? All dharmas. The Buddha perceives all dharmas. That means all phenomena. Tibetan word is what? Chu chu. What? That's a train, don't you? <laughs> now he's it's an example of a fixing of a fi of associating a sound erroneously. That's not it's sometimes called the chu chu, but later that's called the it's called the train. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, ch, ch, not chu chu, but ch, not twice, just once, is the Tibetan word for dharma, like sangye ch dang soke chog nam lang. So the uh, uh, different, uh, there are different synonyms for phenomena, one of which is established base. Existent is another thing. If something is existent, it is a phenomena, it is an established base. Object of knowledge, sheja, we say, that which is capable of being known, another synonym, 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 synonym of phenomena. Right? The different synonym, I can't even say cinnamon, cinnamon, cinnamon. <laughs> I can when I try. So you could, you could, you, I think someone could make a nice kind of comic strip for this class. You could have synonym rolls for breakfast. <laughs> this thing. And you could have choo-choo, choo-choo choo -choo, choo -choo trains or something like that. So here it's, talk <coughs> it's talking about phenomena. If something is, exists, in other words, if something is an established base, it's an existent. If something is an established base, the conceptual consciousness apprehending it is necessarily factually concordant. 
conceptual consciousness. If something is not an established base, if it doesn't exist, the conceptual consciousness apprehending it is necessarily factually discordant. It's factually, a factually discordant conceptual consciousness. For instance, the, how about the conceptual consciousness apprehending a self of persons? Is that factually concordant? If it's not factually concordant, that means the object that it's apprehending exists or doesn't exist. If it's discordant, it doesn't, the, the object doesn't exist. It's not a phenomena, it's not an established base, it's not an object of knowledge. A self, can a self of persons be known? I mean, self of persons does exist, doesn't it? Conventional self of persons. But apprehending, let's say, a, a, when we talk about self of persons, in this context we're talking about the wrong self. It's not, it's not as though there's no Marcy. When you say, you know, everything is selfless, everything is empty. It's not as though Marcy doesn't exist. There is a conventionally existent person called Marcy who's imputed onto the collection of aggregates, the five aggregates. Marcy's parts. Okay? The body, then the five, the four mental aggregates. That does exist, but that's the only that self of persons does exist, but when the Buddha said anatma, no self, he wasn't saying that there was no self whatsoever. He was saying that the self that we, when we know Marcy or we know Chris or we know Maureen, there appears to be a self existing. Once we give the name Maureen, it looks like there's Maureen existing from her own side, even though only existent, the only kind of Maureen that exists is the conventionally, conceptually designated phenomena that we impute. Even though it seems, it seems so counterintuitive, counter it seems like, yeah, and Maureen is there, you know, existing from her own side. That's, that apprehension is, is grasping to this wrong self, to a truly existent self. So if you were to, if, if something is not factually concordant, that means the object that it's apprehending, if a conceptual consciousness is not factually concordant or factually discordant, that means the object that it's apprehending does not exist actually, like the horns of a rabbit or my million dollars. <laughs> right? Maybe someday they'll be factually concordant. So here, with regard to the second of the threefold division of awareness and knowers, non-conceptual, non-mistaken consciousnesses, which take a specifically characterized phenomena as their apprehended object. What does that mean? Non-conceptual, non-mistaken consciousness. Is that a direct perceiver? Is it necessarily a direct perceiver? Well, those yogic, those things are all divisions of direct perceiver, right? So that doesn't contradict. What if it's uh, if it's not non-conceptual? What kind of non-conceptual consciousnesses are there? There are direct perceivers, and there are mistaken non-conceptual consciousnesses, right? Like seeing a, a, an eye consciousness that sees two moons or something. So here it's just talking about the correct ones. So th these would be. That'd be another another way of saying that maybe it would be direct perceivers, right? They take specifically characterized phenomena in permanent things as their apprehended objects. So there's two div two parts: divisions, definition, and divisions. A non a definition of something being a non-conceptual, non-mistaken consciousness is a knower having clear appearance, which is not mistaken with regard to its appearing object. Okay, so a direct perceiver, remember that. Remember at the beginning, what did we say? A non-conceptual, remember you just read the definition a little while ago, non-conceptual, non-mistaken knower. Here it says, a knower which has a clear, having a clear appearance, which is not mis non-mistaken with regard to its appearing object. Okay, before in that definition of direct perceiver, it said it actually, it said, it was sufficient to just say not mistaken with respect to its appearing object because a conceptual consciousness is necessarily mistaken with its with regard to its appearing object could this be a mistaken 
You know, so it's because it's not mistaken. Right? It's not mistaken with regard to its appearing object. Okay. The two, non-conceptual mistaken consciousness and directly perceiving awareness are synonyms. So this is a direct perceiver. Okay. When non-conceptual, non-mistaken consciousnesses are divided, that is, when direct perceivers are divided, there are four, sense, mental, sense-knowing, and yogic. So we know that. Since they were already explained before, above, one should know this. <laughs> so that's a good thing to know. What are the four divisions of, do you know, Sarah, you weren't here at the time, uh, the four divisions of direct per perceivers? I just enumerated them, but see if you know. Quiet, you, oh, no, no. <laughs> be good girl. I know you want to create the karma to have the answer when you're in third grade in another life, but <laughs> you got to do it right here. Yogic, yeah, no, but what was the most obvious one? Um, Give me a hint. Sense, sense direct perceivers, mental, mental yogic. yogic, and self-knowing self -knowing direct perceivers. So those are the four divisions that we talked about. Okay, and then if you had sense direct perceivers, how would you divide those? Do you know? Oh, yes. What? What are the divisions of sense direct perceivers? Uh, Besides saying five, but just uh, if you divide it into three. Sense direct perceivers. Yeah. Are just, are, are just talking. I'm sorry, maybe, maybe I'm wrong, but it's just going through the um, body. The eye, ear, no. no, I'm talking about if there's three divisions. Do you know, Venable? If there's three divisions, I don't Prime know. cognizers, subsequent cognizers, and oh. inattentive, the consciousness to which an object appears is not apparent. Okay. So that it's good to remember at least those, who knows, that might be on the final exam. <laughs> <laughs> who knows? You know? Sleight of hand, my dear. <laughs> no, you were talking about the four, and then you said, what are the three? So, of the, uh, and then I took, say, sense direct perceivers, and I said, it itself is divided. Of course, you could divide it into the five senses, but in another way, any sense direct perceiver is of three types. Prime cognizer, subsequent cognizer, or a consciousness to which an object appears but is not apprehended. But not all direct perceivers have those three divisions, do they? What's an exception? Krishna's the exception, I think. Not at this moment. Yogic direct perceivers, if I, say, if I gave you a hint, yogic direct perceivers, do they have all three of those divisions? They, have, they can be prime? No, they always are. Uh, they always are apprehend their objects. They're never... Um, right. Inattentive, right? They're not, not, not inattentive. So, but in general, all of the all of the direct perceivers would have three divisions, except in the case of yogic direct perceivers. It said they don't; they're not inattentive for some reason. Okay. Okay. So then, on the bottom of the page, it says, with regard to the third of the threefold division of awareness and knowers, non-conceptual mistaken consciousnesses, which take a clear appearance of a non-existent as their apprehended object. So the apprehended object, that is the appearing object, is the clear appearance of a non-existent. So seeing two moons, what's the appearing object? I had said this before, I mentioned before, I, I misspoke on another occasion. What's the appearing object? It's the clear appearance of a non-existent. So it's, the appearing object is the appearance of two moons, but the actual referent object, the thing that it's referring to, is just a single moon. Right. But the, the appearing object, what's being apprehended, is a double moon. What's the object of engagement? And so, in general, the object of engagement is the same for, for a... Uh, generally, for a direct perceiver, and I'm not sure this is the same, so you have to check, the appearing object and the engaged object are the same, right? How about here? Is the object actually being engaged the same as the appearing object? The appearing object is only imputed in this case because there's... Oh, no, say, there is an appearing object, the clear appearance of a double moon. Uh, is, um, 
Is there an engaged object? What's, what's the object being engaged? Double moon. Does such a thing exist? No. So maybe in this case you could say this is, this is different than a direct perceiver where the appearing object and the engaged object are the same. Here, it, according to the way that the text is written, the appearing object does exist. It's the clear appearance of, an, of a, what? What's the word it says? Non-existent? That means it's clearly appearing, but, it's, it, but such a thing doesn't exist. Like, like say, for instance, uh, the, the firebrand, a circle of a circle of fire or something like that. But the object engaged doesn't exist. So you would say, that it looks like you would say that there is an appearing object, but there is no object of engagement. They're different in this case. It looks like. So there's no object of engagement? Or well, the, the object of engagement, you could say, you could posit, you say, what is the object of engagement? Posit the object of engagement, you could say it is the double moon but a double moon doesn't exist. But the appearing object is not a double moon, it's the, the clear appearance of a double moon. And that is appearing, yeah. right? right, to that. But so are you saying that all objects of engagement have to exist? If, no. no, I'm saying if, uh, uh, if, something, uh, if something is an object in general, that's another synonym of existent. Mm -hmm. If something is an object in general, it has to exist. Mm -hmm. But, and so if something is actually an object of engagement, it has to exist. So, but you can still posit, say for instance, if you perceive, say, a determined object, what's the, what's the conceived object or determined object of a conception conceiving of the horns of a rabbit? Is, is it the horns of a rabbit? Is that a conceived object? Well, you'd have to say then it's an object. Then if it's a conceived object, it's an object, therefore it has to exist. But you can posit it as that but it's not a real, it's not the real, it's not a real conceived object. So the engaged object here would be, uh, po could be posited as a double moon, but such doesn't exist. And I think the, if, I think the referent object in this case would be the single moon. So you'd have the single moon as the referent object. The engaged object doesn't exist, but if posited as a double moon, the appearing object does exist, is the clear appearance of a double moon. Okay, so it's still to be finally decided by you in debate. The definition on the next page, see, the definition of something being a non-conceptual mistaken consciousness is a knower having the clear appearance which is, having clear appearance which is mistaken with regard to its appearing object. A knower having, the, having clear appearance which is mistaken with respect to its appearing object. Couldn't that be a conceptual consciousness? Yours is non-conceptual. What's wrong with that? Couldn't that be a conceptual consciousness? Here it says a non-conceptual mistaken consciousness. That would mean like seeing two moons or something like that. A knower having, the, having clear appearance which is mistaken with regard to its appearing object. How could it have clear appearance and be mistaken? Well, is this, you know, you have a clear appearance, you know, and still, you know, and uh, so, what are we just talking about? When we said that, like, two moons appearing objects, or the more appearance of the non-existent, you can see it very clearly. It's clearly appearing, yeah. Mm -hmm. So why could this not be a, a conceptual consciousness? Because it says it's non-existent. That's the... That's the definendum, right? But the definition, why couldn't, you know, for definition to hold, there has to be eight doors of pervasion between the definendum and the definition. Okay? So, I mean, it, it, you know, it's, you know, you say, the definition of a pot is that which has a flat base, fat belly, hanging lip, able to hold water. If it has those attributes, it has to be a pot. If it is a pot, it has to have those attributes. If you have those attributes, it has to be, you have to have a pot. If you have a pot, you have to have those attributes and so forth. Those are called the eight doors of privation. And if you don't have a pot, you don't have those attributes, all those sort of things. So, 
I was just talking about the definition of this definition and definition. So a knower which has a clear appearance which is mistaken with regard to its appearing object. Isn't a conceptual consciousness mistaken with regard to its appearing object? But, but maybe the clear appearance part because the, the conceptual consciousness is apprehending a meaning generality. Is that Does, so it doesn't have a clear appearance. It might seem that way in our conception, but there's a difference that clear appearance is, is that which occurs to a non-conceptual consciousness. So some dreaming, remember before, some dreaming consciousnesses have clear appearance. Some you might think are clear, but they're actually conceptual. And you're actually apprehending something via a mental image. So clear appearance is kind of a synonym here for uh, The, that which appears to a non-conceptual consciousness. Okay. When non-conceptual, non-mistaken consciousnesses are divided, there are two, sense and mental consciousnesses, which are non-conceptual, mental, uh, mistaken consciousnesses. That's easy, right? Sense, consciousness, which is non-conceptual, mistaken consciousness, common locus, that which is a common locus of being non-conceptual mistaken consciousness, so it's general, you know, and being produced in dependence on the physical sense power, which is its uncommon empowering condition. It's easy, right? Mental, the definition of the second, a mental consciousness, which is a non-conceptual mistaken consciousness, is a common locus. Remember this word, common locus? That which is both. A common locus. A locus, how do we talk about it? In, here in Tibetan we say shitun, common basis, that which is both. Uh, I'm a non-conceptual mistaken consciousness and also produced in dependence upon a mental sense power which is its uncommon empowering condition. So that would be like a dream consciousness or something. With regard to awarenesses, okay, so We've divided up uh, awareness into different ways, into seven, into three. And now here's another. Now it's saying, furthermore, with regard to awareness, there are two. You can divide it into two, self-knowers and other-knowers. What are, what, what are other-knowers? Are these two divisions mutually exclusive? Are they contradictory? Dan, do you know what another-knower is? Mm -hmm. Looks pretty good. Pretty good. Yes. So an, a, an other knower is that which knows something other than its own entity, like a consciousness which is knowing some other object. Could be, could be actually one part of consciousness can know another part of consciousness. That's still other knower. Self knowers are just the, the one entity of consciousness which knows it's, that it is knowing. Remember when we talked about self knowing Rangrik? The second, other knower, say the first of those, self-knower and consciousness which is directly directed only inward are syn synonyms. So this word rangrik that we talked about before, self-knower, is one of the four divisions of direct perceivers. Uh, we had a definition of it, that which has the aspect of an apprehender. That, in other words, what it is, the aspect which it, which is, is knowing is apprehension itself. It is knowing its own ability to know. And here it says a consciousness which is, which is directly directed only inward. So it isn't directed outside from itself, knowing other than apprehension. It's not knowing other objects. Other knowers are consciousnesses which are na which are turned outwards. So it's knowing something other than itself. Sense, mental, and yogic direct perceivers, as well as conceptual consciousnesses, are illustration of the second, other knowers. Are, can't conceptual consciousnesses be self-knowers? Yes. Pat, what do you think? Conceptual consciousness can't be self-knower? Why not? You're not Pat. I'm going with Mark. <laughs> Can conceptual consciousness be self-knower? Pardon? What? 
Conceptual, Conceptual consciousness is one which knows its object via mental image. But remember, self-knowers are direct perceivers. Are direct perceivers, you know, the, a conceptual consciousness can have a self-knower which is knowing it, part of that consciousness which is knowing it, but that self-knower itself is not a conceptual consciousness. It is a direct perceiver. It is knowing that it is knowing. Okay? Knowing the consciousness. So whatever is any of those, sense, mental, yogic, or conceptual consciousness, must be an other knower. So conceptual consciousness has to be other knower itself. So self-knower is not a conceptual consciousness, it is a direct perceiver. With regard to self-knowers and other knowers being contradictory, Okay, we'll just mention here, just so you can, so at the Ugly Mug, if you want to go sometime this week and debate with Thea and Maureen, here's something you debate. And Karen, Karen also? Mondays and Thursdays. Okay, and you can surf, you can surf the internet, you bring down your notebook. Yep, Mondays and Thursdays. With regard to self-knowers and other knowers being contradictory, are they contradictory? If something is a self-knower, it's not another knower, right? Something is another knower, it's not a self-knower. Someone might say, it follows that the subject, a self-knower, in the continuum of Buddha superior, is not an other knower because it is a self-knower. Okay, you can read, you can, you can debate about that. I'm not going to debate about that. No. Okay. Buddha is always a special factor, a special case. So I'm just, going to, I'm just going to introduce this next section now. Another way, furthermore, on page 46, with regard to awareness and knowers, there are two. Another way of dividing, mind and mental factors. We say sem is mind, and sem jung. Sem, jungwa means ar arisen. Sem le jungwa means arisen from the mind. So, as Dan had said the other day when I asked what's the definition, you knew that, didn't you, Dan? The definition of, somehow we talked before about the definition of Primary mind, or primary mind and mind. Here, it's, here it says main mind. Uh, we call it primary mind, mind sentience or mentality. Ye and perceiver or consciousness are mutually inclusive and synonymous. That is, a main mind or a primary consciousness is a main knower that is posited by way of apprehending the entity of its object. So primary minds mainly just know the entity of the object, just its general, the entity of the perceptual field. Whereas mental factors enter into knowing particularities about the perceptual field. Uh, or they, you know, like they, like feeling is a mental factor. Within the, the main mind, the, not something different, sort of like one part of the mind, but the, the way that the mind enters into one particular aspect of the, ap of the apprehended field, like feeling, sensation, that is called a mental factor. That which ar is arisen from the mind is a semjong, we say in Tibetan. So in the five aggregates, the last aggregate is actually main mind. Main, primary mind. Did you know that? Animal? It's not mental factors? Consciousness. It's consciousness, right? But is, it, is consciousness, can consciousness be mind and, can, can it be primary mind and mental factors? Consciousness aggregate. It's just the main mind. Why? Because all the other mental factors are when you talk about dividing up the person, you might say, why? How could you have consciousness? Aren't these other things consciousness? Isn't feeling consciousness and discrimination and non-associated compositional factors, aren't those all consciousness? Well, they're, they're conscious phenomena, they're knowing, they're knowers, they're awareness, but they're not what's called vijnana or primary consciousness. They're not the, the fifth aggregate, when we talk, you know the five aggregates? The, 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 you know what the five aggregates are? Form, feeling, 
discrimination, compositional factors, consciousness. So that consciousness aggregate doesn't mean mental factors. It means only primary consciousness. So it means the eye primary consciousness, ear primary consciousness, nose, taste, tactile, and mental primary consciousnesses. Just the entities of those consciousnesses. And all of, their, all of the entities that arise, all of the factors that arise within those consciousnesses are called mental factors. They're found, they're either feeling, discrimination, and everything else is included in the fourth aggregate non-associated compositional factors. That doesn't fit well, huh? Chris? Uh, just You're just mind, thinking. Mind, right? sounds like general and specific. Huh? Uh, here, there's a difference between main mind. Like, say, for instance, the waves on the ocean, the actual the entity of the waves is still water, but they are different. They, they have particular aspects than uh, rather than the the ocean itself, so the main mind maybe in that sense is like the it's like the ocean. Uh, the, uh, the main mind is sometimes like the nowadays we say the CEO, I guess, rather than the king or the president. And the mental factors are like the retinue that come along and do the particular things. Okay. So let me just introduce this. When minds are divided by way of entity, there are six. So there's, there's the five senses and mental, right? There are four possibilities between the two. Sentience and mental consciousness. So this is a little bit tricky because this is playing on the Tibetan word. The word sentience here, like we say sentient being, I don't know if that's a good way to translate yi. It's, we can call mentality maybe. Uh, or maybe sentience, it's just another synonym for primary mind. So if we put it a different way, there are four possibilities between primary mind and mental consciousness, right? This is because when we say four possibilities, you know what the, in general, when we say there are four alternatives or possibilities between two things, what that means? The four possibilities are if you have like A and B, that which is A and B, that which is A but not B, that which is B but not A, and that which is neither A nor B. Those are called the four alternatives between two things. No, not, not three. Four. <laughs> oh, there's three minutes, okay. He's, He's giving me three minutes. Sign. So, for instance, okay, let's check here. We'll just do the four po possibilities here between primary mind and mental consciousness. So, that which is both is primary mental consciousness, okay? Uh, ding, ding, ding. Let's see, here, here it goes, it, it, it goes, let's go the order that it goes. This is because an eye perceiver is a possibility that is sentience, that is a, a um, what do we call it? A primary mind. Eye, eye perceiver is, uh, we say primary eye consciousness is a primary consciousness, but is not a mental consciousness. Primary eye, eye consciousness, primary eye consciousness, is primary consciousness, but not mental consciousness, right? So that's one alternative. So that's A, but not B. Feeling accompanying a mental perceiver is a possibility or alternative that is a mental consciousness, but is not a, is not sentience, is, is not a, uh, primary mind, because it's a mental factor. Feeling is a mental factor. So the mental factor in a mental consciousness is, uh, I'd say, mental consciousness, but it is not primary consciousness. A mental perceiver is a possibility or alternative that is both. It is primary consciousness, sentience, and it is a mental consciousness. And the feeling accompanying an eye perceiver is neither. It's, it's an alternative or possibility that is neither sentience. This is neither a primary consciousness, because it's a mental factor, nor is it a mental consciousness. That's easy, isn't it? I mean, you just look at it, what the meaning is. The, the trick is here, they're playing on the Tibetan word yi, because yi by itself means this word sentience, they've translated, which can mean primary mind. And yi she means mental consciousness. 
So, although if something is yi, it doesn't have to be yishe. Something can be primary consciousness and not a mental consciousness. Is mental consciousness synonymous with mental factor? No. Mental consciousness is the consciousness of our, the, the sixth consciousness. And it, it, can, it has both a primary consciousness and, a mental, and mental factors within it. And our mental consciousness can have feeling and, and all of these different things, okay? So I'll just give the definition of a mental factor is a knower which apprehends any of the features of its objects and accompanies whatever main mind it has similarity with. So I'll ask you if you can, for next time, if you read this final section and then the last chapter about uh, expressive sounds, because we have one more class left, and then a practice day. Actually, we'll have practice day this Sunday. Right? Can you tell us what to expect from practice? No. <laughs> oh, yeah. We'll do to practice. We're going to practice. We're going to meditate. Uh, if you bring your text with you, and we're going to uh, do some different kind of meditation and try to recognize what consciousnesses on the lawn rim that we have that are still doubting consciousnesses and which are wrong consciousnesses and which are... Uh, maybe correct beliefs and try to understand these things from an experiential point of view. Okay? So let's just quickly dedicate uh, I don't know if you can dedicate negative energy, negative karma. You probably can, but it was called dedication. Usually dedication means due to this virtue that I've created. It's sort of if it's an asp aspiration, mental factor aspiration, which is in the which is uh, in your mental consciousness. In this case, it's conceptual. It's a conceptual consciousness, wishing that these merits ripen in a certain way, stronger than wish, sort of a determination. I am dedicating. May they ripen in my achievement of enlightenment for the welfare of all living beings. And once having done conventional dedication, I'll try to seal in the emptiness of the three spheres. <laughs>